Well, today is Father's Day, right? Yes. And so typically, we know the expected Father's Day message should be how men should step up and be the right kind of men that they should be. And we know that, um, I think typically that Father's Day messages would be on fathers and how they should be, how they should be wonderful men of God and fathers, right? Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. All right, okay. <laughs> I, I think of the time that uh, the, the phrase in the book of Job comes to me where God tells Job, okay, Job, stand up and be a man. Present yourself, gird your loins. It's translated in different ways. The uh, New Living Translation says, brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you that I want you to answer. <laughs> that was when, of course, Job was complaining to God about how things were going. And then I think of the verse in Malachi about fathers, and it tells us that when a great revival comes, the God will send the spirit of Elijah, and it says this, that he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of children to their fathers. And obviously the reaction should be, well, aren't fathers' hearts always toward the children? And aren't, uh, and aren't children's hearts always toward the fathers? And sadly, no. But uh, that is what God intends. We should understand Father's Day, these are the kind of things we should talk about. But what I want to do today is take a little different tack. I want us to pull way back and assess our situation and reflect on our lives in a very broad, general way. And I, I trust you will be encouraged and challenged by it. So here is your situation. Man and woman, our situation. Here's your situation. You exist in a created way. You are a created person. Your body is a creation of God. And we can never cease marveling the intelligence it took with the genetic coding. And I've dealt with and talked about this stuff before. But we are a marvel with how much intelligence went into our bodies to create us. How many chemicals how much electrical system, how much of a plumbing system, how, how many miles, miles and miles of, of blood vessels in this. And then that isn't even to contemplate the idea of your soul and of your spirit. But God has done a marvelous thing and put tremendous thought into you. That, has a, that you have a body, you have a life, you have a soul, you have a spirit. And then you are living in a created world, in a created universe. And if you want to talk to some people that have really strange ideas, you don't need to go to religious people. Listen to physicists. I, <laughs> I went on YouTube and tried to listen to their, their new theories about reality. They are far out. But they realize that the existence of reality in and, in, in and of itself uh, is just super amazing. Einstein talked about the, uh, the space-time is a fabric that we're, we're dwelling in. But just without going there fully, just generally to say everything in our whole universe is a created existence. And it is amazing. That's where you are living in. Now, here's another fact. You are only going to live in this existence for a very short time. Even if you live 100 years old, that is a very short time. And someone that's lived 70% of that time already, it's going by very fast and short. So <laughs> life is short. And we need to to consider that. It's important because the Bible and Jesus tells us that while God has given us life, 
we are going to be judged about our lives. At the end of our lives is appointed for men to live and to die once, and after that we are judged. Jesus said even our careless words are, are, are just idle little words we don't even think about that much, we will have to give an account for. So, we are to know that we are going to be held accountable for our lives. And the Bible teaches us that we will either spend our lives in heaven with God or in hell. Another part of the story that is wonderful is that the God who created all of this is really a fantastic God of character, not only of power and wisdom and strength and might, but of love and great caring. He really cares for you. So that is comforting, and we'll be talking more about that in a moment. But as God as creator, he really wanted you and all his created beings, including angels and seraphim and everything that he's created that, that has some thought, not to be puppets, not to be devoid of soul and, and of, of thought, but he's given us complete freedom to be however we want to be. Would we have it any other way? I don't think so. But that's the reality of creation. When you give somebody complete freedom, people are going to test the limits. People are going to do their own thing. And we really wouldn't want it any other way. The problem with that is people don't always choose correctly. And if you look at the history of mankind, we see that there are wars, there's evil, there's murder, there's all kinds of terrible sins that people commit against God and against one another. But God has devised a plan to separate us from our sins because, you see, God as a good God and as the God of the universe cannot excuse sin. I've told the story before how I was asked to visit a lady one time, I didn't know her, but she was bitter. And I went into the house of pastor and started talking to her, and she starts saying, you can't tell me that God just forgives and forgets things. That would be just terrible. I cannot believe that. And you can tell she was speaking from a pain where she had really been violated, and the more she talked, I realized she's totally right. And so I agreed with her. I said, you know, you are absolutely right. That would be totally unjust. Just if somebody does terrible things to another person and then say, that's okay. We'll just forget about it. We won't deal with it, right? That's right. But I said, that is the whole purpose of the law. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life. That demands justice. If there's sin, you got to hit it. you got to punish it. You can't let it go. But I said, that's the whole purpose of the cross. That's why God sent his son. He didn't say, we'll just forget about sin. We're going to deal with it. And his son came as a son of God in human form, said, stretched, stretched himself out in place of our punishment. He took the chastisement that made us whole. By his stripes we are made whole. He, he presented himself as an atonement for sin. He stepped into our place to pay the penalty. That's why the cross is so brutal. That's why Isaiah prophesied so much about him. How he would see the torment of his soul and by that he, he would make the penalty for sin. He would make an atonement for sin. So God made a penalty to be paid for. So now all these decrees, just like if you get a traffic ticket, you know, there are decrees spiritually kept track of everything you do wrong. He said he took all of those and nailed them to the cross in Christ. So God is a God with tremendous legal sensitivities but he's made a way for you to be free from all this. And then not only does he pay the penalty for our sins that we can appreciate what he suffered for because he bore our sins. He paid the penalty 
Then next what God does is he comes in and makes us new. And we know none of us can exist in the glory of God. It would be like stepping into a nuclear reactor, into the fire, and say, okay, I'm going to live here for eternity. It would be impossible. But God also does a miracle within our hearts that makes us new. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. And so when we invite, when we receive God's forgiveness, and we ask Him to come into our lives and make us new, we are reborn in the Spirit. The Bible says if anyone is joined to the Lord, he becomes one spirit with him. And in our spirit man, we become, we have a new cre uh, creation. The Bible says it's an anchor of the soul that enters in behind the veil. The veil is a separation between us and God in the Holy of Holies. And, and that veil goes, that connection is right into the throne room of God, into the heart of God. You are now seated with Christ in heavenly places. So now we are going to be remade so we can live eternally. And that inner nature will help us change the outer nature. And we are being transformed from one degree of glory into another. God wants you to live in glory. God wants you to have eternal life and be totally blessed. So isn't that a wonderful plan? Amen. That is an awesome thing that God has done for us. And if you've ever talked to people that have been to heaven, and it seems like we've heard so many, lately on the internet is Kat Kerr. She comes and goes back and forth from heaven all the time, and she is telling us about what heaven is like, and that is awesome. Bob Jones, a prophetic man, same thing. He, he would have visitations by the Lord, but the Lord would take him back and forth to heaven. We had a deacon in our uh, last church we in before we came here, was dead for three hours and in an explosion and, and woke up and he was visiting with his brother in front of his mansion who died before and talked about the glory. I talked, we uh, uh, listened to, uh, went down to Des Moines to hear testimony by Dr. Evie who was coming through, who, who died, was dead for hours, woke up in the morgue and he had been to heaven describing heaven. We have a fantastic God that loves us so much, in spite of our sins, He wants to transform us into the way He is and to live in all the goodness and all the holiness. So we are to reject sin. We are to reject evil because the problem is all people have sinned. All come short of the glory of God. Amen? Amen. You here know that. But it's good to think about this again. One thing I think is wonderful is that God is so incredibly smart. Like I said, the uh, physicists are still trying to understand just the concept of reality, how it can be here. And if you're a nurse or a doctor, if you've heard anything about how the body works and the complications of it, you know, God is extremely intelligent. He has such wisdom and insight and knowledge. But the good thing is, God doesn't expect you to be a genius in order to be saved. You don't have to know all the complexities of everything before he would say, okay, you're smart enough to be one of my kids. I don't want any dummies in heaven, and you just don't make it. You know, if you're a C-plus student, you're not going to make it. you got to be an A-plus student, perfect in all understanding, or you can't come into my house. Aren't you glad it isn't that way? Well, some of you A people, you know, you might be okay. You might think, that's all right. I think, no, that would not be good. So, <laughs> But what God does, he makes it very simple. He brings it down just to the, the simplest thing. He said, if you trust me to save you, I will be so blessed by your trust in me. I will, I will accept that as righteousness in your behalf, that I will make you right. I will, I will make you born again. So to compare as an example, it's like, do you understand electricity or light or electromagnetism about all the eons or the 27 seven different quarks that make up an atom or, ah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No, but if you want light in your room, all you have to do is what? I want light in the room and we go, what? We flick a switch. On, off, and that's what God has done. 
but it's a matter of your heart, of your choice. Do you say, yes, I want it? So I like the fact that God makes it simple, but we have to decide if we like God, we want God, or not. The Bible clearly says that there are two different ways. Jesus talked about the world system, and it's evil. Now we, I think naturally, we don't tend to think of people as all evil, do we? But the Bible is telling us that you're either of the world or you're of God. And you can seem like a nice person, but if you're not following the Lord, you're going to be deceived, you're going to go off into a world system, and it's going to be evil. People constantly have created governments out of their goodness. How about communalism, you know? We'll just have everybody share everything together. If you don't believe me, I'm putting you in jail. I'm going to throw you into prison if you don't agree with me. And, and we're going to, you know, communism has killed hundreds of millions of people. Well, 100 million at least, I know, generally speaking. And in China, tens of millions more. But look at all the governments of the world. How often they have been evil. How often it's led to tragedy. And people say, well, we believe people are naturally good by nature. No, that's not really true. The Bible says in Ephesians, uh, before they became Christians, this is what it was like, Paul said of them, which is true of all people. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, of course that's the satanic spirit, Satan, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. You are either a child, a son of disobedience, or you have to be a child of God, being born again, being transformed. There's only two ways to go. And he continues, among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. We were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But the other choice is, God save me. Forgive me for my sins. Bring me to your kingdom. Let me live in your glory. You cannot say, well, I, I'll decide later. Not to decide is to decide. The Bible is very clear. The default position in your life, unless you turn and, and, and accept the Lord, the default position is you're going to be thrown out into the lake of fire. The whole concept is God is wanting the people that are not evil but want to be good, even though they still have some outside nature that isn't perfect. But here's what I'm trying to emphasize today. Christians in America, many Christians in America, see their Christianity as just a label. Okay, put a label on, I'm a Christian, and I can tell you so many stories of Christians I've known. They say they're Christian, but I think they're deceiving themselves. Many Christians will say, well, you know, I'm a Christian, so I don't need to worry about sin. And I can kind of live my life however I want. And if it's convenient and desirable for me to sleep around, I'll do that. Because I'm a Christian, it's okay. I don't need to worry about sin. Because I'm a Christian, I believe in God, so I don't really need to go to church. I'm a Christian and I believe, so I don't really need to give anything. I don't need to further the work of the Lord. Even though he tells me to, I, I just won't. I don't need to read my Bible because I'm a Christian. I'm already saved, I'm okay. I don't need to really pray every day. I don't need to really worship God. I don't need to really praise God. I don't need to win this because I'm a Christian, I believe. You may not agree with me, but I agree with me. <laughs> I know people think that way. 
What I'm saying is people are going to wake up and be surprised. They said they were Christian, but our, we are saved by our faith. James, we do not believe in a salvation of works. But James says, if, if I believe, my works will prove out that I believe. The Bible says this, Romans 6. What shall I say then? Are we to continue in sin because grace, so grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? In fact, the Hebrew says when we go into sin and we keep sinning, going to evil, we're re, we're re crucifying Christ. But it says, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So we have to understand that salvation encompasses the whole concept of going toward God and loving righteousness or, or we can say a Christian, I don't care anymore if people call themselves Christians. I've been burned by so many Christians, in, 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 whether within church or in business dealings, and they say, well, they're a Christian, but if you're a Christian, who needs the devil? And there are a lot of Christians that are living like the devil. They are not obeying Jesus Christ. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but not do the things that I tell you to do? I think the Bible teachings are very clear that we cannot just say Christian salvation is about putting a label on your head. I went forward in church one time. Yeah, I believe Jesus, Son of God. And then we go out and live like the devil or don't take care of who, what Jesus says. That kind of salvation. I'm afraid there's going to be a lot of people that are going to wake up dead and say, Lord! And what's the Lord going to say? I never knew you. Depart from me. How can that be? But that's scripture, isn't it? If those verses don't fit into your theology, then you need to get your theology in line with scripture. It's a whole package deal. Don't say you're a Christian and you're not following the Lord. You're not doing the things the Lord tells you to do. And you're living like the devil. You're deceiving yourself. That kind of Christianity will not make the cut. As things come closer to the end times, you're not going to be able to stand. Jesus says to the church in uh, Revelation, He said, I would that you were hot or cold, but because you're just lukewarm, I'm going to just speak out of my mouth. Does that sound like easy believers in Christianity is going to work? I don't think so. The Bible is very clear with this kind of stuff. In, in 1 John, he was the oldest living apostle who wrote the last letters. And this is what, what he said. By this we know if we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, he is a liar. The truth is not in you. Is that pretty strong? Yeah. It's a whole package deal. You can't separate out faith and your actions and think that you can just put a label, say, I'm a Christian, and now I won't give, I won't go to church, I'll mess around, I don't really care what God says, and I'm saved by grace. And that, no, that is not the way it, it will work. Our faith says, I choose to love God and His righteousness and follow Him and believe in Him and go after Him. Not, oh yeah, I believe in God, but I'm going to follow the devil. I'm going to act like the devil. I'm not going to obey the Lord in anything. We have to understand our theology has to be wrapped up and solid together. Here again, Ephesians 5, 5. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. But wait a minute. I thought those people who proclaimed Christ, they went forward in church, and they believed in Jesus, and so they're, why are you telling me this, Paul? 
He continues, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. It's a package deal. And we have it offered to us. But we can't play games with it. The idea is you love God and you love righteousness and you're walking after Him or not. Here's the wonderful deal about it all. <laughs> If we accept to walk after the Lord, believe in Him, and be His follower, we have what the Bible keeps talking about throughout the New Testament is a glorious inheritance. He's going to receive you into His kingdom to live forever in glory. Here's just a few verses. Paul is talking in Ephesians 1 about, quote, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? What is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? Peter talked this way, 1 Peter 1, verse 4, that to, there is an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, Kept, for, kept in heaven for you. See, the Bible makes it very clear. Jesus talked about gathering in the harvest, whether it was grain or fish, and sorting out the wheat from the tares and the bad fish and the good fish, and then the bad is thrown into the fire. It's basically like this. He is talking about the difference between the stuff that is garbage, that you don't want in your home, that he doesn't want in his home, and the stuff that is wonderful, he's going to treasure and bring into his home. And ultimately, if you're measured as garbage and evil, falling at the devil, he's going to throw it into the pit that ultimately he's going to have a lake of fire, he throws that fire, everything into that fire, and then he takes that whole hell and he flings it into space to forever travel away, away, away from God. Besides the pain, because you are also going to be, you have an eternal life, and you know whether you accept Christ or not. Jesus said the time is coming when all who are in grave are going to wake up and, and hear his voice, some to glory and some to eternal punishment. He also uses the valley of Hinnom, which was the garbage dump, as, as a picture of hell, where they threw criminals' bodies, animals' bodies. And uh, in my hometown of Parker, they always had a dump, and it was always burning out there. You take stuff out, you throw it into the old uh, garbage pit. Things are always fires going, and that is what hell is going to be like. You don't want to go there. Don't play games. Get your theology straight. It's not a label that saves you. It's a heart of transformation, becoming the man and the woman of God that God wants you to be. Am I scaring you enough? It's called the fear of God. We really need to have the fear of God. But understand, it's, it's the love of God that should also constrain us. Amen? Amen. But His great love for us, he, has, he wants to bless you for all of eternity. He wants to give you a mansion. He wants to give you uh, an eternal life, never sickness, never pain. Constant blessing upon blessing for eternity. What a fantastic deal. In Ephesians 1 and 8, it says, His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, in heaven and things on earth. In Him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. You cannot express the blessing of the glorious inheritance that is yours. It's yours right now if we just say, Lord, I follow you. I am believing in you. So what does all this mean as we wrap this message up today? 
Today is Father's Day. What should be our response? Well, men, what, what do you think God would say to us? Stand up and be a man. Stand up and be the man of God that God wants you to be. Or woman, be the kind of woman that God wants you to be. You know, holiness and power and righteousness and obedience to everything he says. Now, if you might feel like, well, our country and the world's going to hell in a handbasket, well, you don't have to, right? We don't have to. Regardless of what happens, we have the love of God, and all we have to do is say, Lord, I turn to you. doesn't mean we're perfect, right? Don't, we don't want to get that message out there. It means we turn constantly to the Lord. We live a life trying our best to follow Him and follow after His Spirit. So, concluding the message today when we talk about how we should be as a father of God, a father or a man of God or a woman of God, I think you probably can know very well what all that should be. But let me just uh, close with this then and say, what do you think God's definition of being a real man of God, a real woman of God is, and is for you. Amen? Amen.